Testing, testing, testing. Testing, 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 testing. Testing, testing, testing. Testing, 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 testing. Testing. Let's test on the Twitch. Is it working? Yeah, it seems to be working. Pretty good. All right, let's test on YouTube. All right, YouTube is working well. Perfect. And we're going to need to connect to a different Wi-Fi network in order to control the uh, robot. There we go, this one. How's it going, Generalist Agent? How's it going, Ed? How's it going, Leo? Just getting the robot working here. Robot control. What about this face detection mode? Oh, look at this little buddy. He can hear me. <laughs> Start. Yeah, this mode is quite autonomous. I might just leave him on this. How's it going, Vin? Vinayak? This mode is more power hungry, though, because the robot is constantly scanning and waving, so we'll have to see. Yesterday it died at about one minute, or not one minute, it died at about two hours, and you know, we'll see if it can survive a little bit longer than that. I can pause it for a second there. Today's news, GPT-4 costs 0.3 cents. Kind of, but one thing you have to realize is that all of the OpenAI cost is a Azure bill. You know, so if your biggest investor is the person who's also receiving all the money that you invest, then it doesn't really matter, right? This is a pretty standard playbook, right? So NVIDIA will invest in a company, and then that company will use NVIDIA's investment to buy a bunch of NVIDIA made GPUs, right? And this isn't even limited to technology, right? Whenever the US government gives a nation state money to buy weapons, they use that money to buy American made weapons, right? Whenever the Chinese government use or gives money to some country for infrastructure, they buy that infrastructure from some uh, Chinese construction company. So I don't think Microsoft necessarily cares that OpenAI is burning Azure credits because they're the ones making money from it. It's their own money. All right, guys. How's it going, Josh? Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I think we're almost there. Let's make sure that the X is working, and then we'll go on that. All right. Looks like the X is on. Let's announce this stream, and then let's get started.
All right, welcome to another Hoopo stream. We got our little robot buddy back there. Uh, he's going to be hanging out as well. And today we're going to be uh, looking at a bunch of different uh, text-to-3D and image-to-3D papers that have come out recently. So the name of the stream is DMV3D, which is the name of uh, the first of these papers. So this first paper here, DMV3D, which is a very long acronym for Denoising uh, Multi-View Diffusion, right? So a, a diffusion model denoises. So it's a it's a, just a standard, basically, diffusion model. Multi-view, let's uh, go to yellow. Yellow is the color we should be using here. Uh, Multi-view refers to the fact that it's a 2D diffusion model, but you're using a 2D diffusion model from multiple views, so you're kind of trying to render a 3D thing with multiple views from a 2D diffusion model. And this 3D large reconstruction model is a reference to a previous work. So this work came out in 15th of November 2023, but a 3D large reconstruction model, which they abbreviate as LRM, large reconstruction model, is from 8th November 2023, so just one week ago, and this is the same people here, so you see uh, Sai B, Hao Tan, uh, Kai Zhang, like if you just look over here, it's the same people, Hao Tan, Kai Zhang, Ooh. Sai B, so it's the same research group within Adobe that's basically working on text to 3D and image to 3D. So that's the first paper and kind of the companion paper. Uh, another one that we will be looking at today is 12345++. So this name is also kind of a legacy situation. I think there was an original model or, or an original paper that we read on this channel that was called uh, 123 and then 45. And then this is now the addition to the addition of that paper, which is where that plus plus comes from. Uh, fast single image to 3D objects. So this is image to 3D objects with consistent multi-view generation and 3D diffusion. So again, you see that same uh, multi-view and diffusion. This one is a little bit more interesting though because it actually does have a 3D diffusion model. So that's not something you see every day. Generally, a lot of these uh, 3D papers, they're they're using the 2D diffusion models as a kind of a way to train something usually that looks more like a nerf, but in this paper they actually do train a 3D diffusion model, which is pretty badass. Okay. And then the last one uh, we're going to look at today is from 14th November 2023. Kind of a, a weirder mix of groups here. And this is uh, instant 3D. Instant text to 3D generation and yeah, we'll get into this one. This one has some pretty interesting uh, little tricks that they do. That they uh, do, and it's uh, yeah, we'll we'll look into that because it's quite cool. But yeah, that's basically what we're going to be reviewing today is a bunch of different papers and techniques around text to three D and uh, image to three D. And what's interesting is that these papers have slightly different strategies, so we can really kind of compare and think about what the best future strategy might be. Someone needs to take away naming privileges from these engineers, says Josh Phillips. Yeah, I don't know. I think all of these are misses, to be honest. You know, uh, these names are not very viral. You know, I was literally thinking about that when I named my YouTube video DMV three D one two three four five forty five plus plus. Like, I'm like, I'm pretty sure that the presence of like hyphens and plus pluses and like, no one's gonna click on this fucking video. <laughs> you know. So yeah, we need to we need to teach these uh, people at Adobe Research the uh, how to make catchy names. You know, they should have called it 3D GPT. You know, that would have been a catchy name. Okay, so let's go ahead and read these abstracts, and then uh, we'll kind of dive in from there. So. We propose DMV3D, a novel 3D generation approach that uses a transformer-based 3D large reconstruction model to denoise multi-view diffusion. Okay, so transformer-based refers to the fact that the uh, 
encode the the large kind of vision encoder that they're going to be using inside this model is going to be transformer based right so it's going to be a vision transformer rather than a convnet but i mean that's kind of what you would expect in a 2023 paper uh, again they're also going to be using these uh denoising diffusion models as specifically in a multi-view kind of capacity our reconstruction model incorporates a triplane NERF representation. So it's been a while since we read a NERF paper. You know, we kind of got distracted with all the gosh and splatting papers, but NERFs are still here. You know, people are still using them. And specifically, the one that seems to be more and more popular is this triplane NERF. And we're going to uh, maybe take a little uh, sidestep into that in a second here. Uh, can denoise noisy multi-view images via nerf reconstruction and rendering, achieving single-stage 3D generation in around 30 seconds on an NVIDIA A100 GPU. So uh, we have our first kind of uh, benchmark here. We have 30 seconds on a single A100 GPU for uh, getting a 3D object. We chain... We train DMV3D on large-scale multi-view image data sets of highly diverse objects using only image reconstruction losses without accessing 3D assets. So here this is kind of a flex, is that they're trying to say that the technique that they're going to use to train this model is not going to require a large 3D asset library. So uh, why don't we actually pull that up? A lot of these uh, text-to-3D or image-to-3D uh, models, they generally train on an explicit uh, 3D object library, such as this one. This is Objiverse XL, which is basically 10 million 3D objects that have been curated and are provided by uh, the Allen AI Institute. But uh, in this one, I think they're going to be not using that explicitly and mostly just using a diffusion model. Uh, we demonstrate state-of-the-art results for single image reconstruction where probabilistic modeling of unseen object parts is required for generating diverse reconstructions with sharp textures. So state-of-the-art, it's not actually going to be state-of-the-art, right? State-of-the-art for something like image to 3D or text to 3D is very difficult to judge, very difficult to quantify. There's kind of the subjective element to it. And it's also, you don't really have access to other people's models, so... I don't know, state of the art, not actually a valid uh, statement there. We also show high quality text to 3D generation results outperforming previous 3D diffusion models. Our project website is there. Okay, so that's the first one. Why don't we also take a look at the abstract uh, for their first paper. So this is the same group, but a paper that was released a week earlier. We propose the first large reconstruction model that predicts the 3D model of an object from a single input image within just five seconds. So here's another one image and then five seconds and then you get the 3D object. In contrast to many previous methods that are trained on small scale data sets such as ShapeNet in a category specific fashion, LRM adapts a highly scalable transformer based architecture, which, okay, same thing, vision transformer with 500 million learnable parameters to directly predict a neural radiance field from the input image. Okay, so it's directly predicting a NERF, which is actually what uh, Shape E and Pointy do, right? Shape E and Pointy are the OpenAI kind of text to 3D, image to 3D uh, models, and interesting that they're kind of choosing to go down that path. We train our model in an end-to-end -end manner on a massive multi-view data set containing around 1 million objects, so this one is trained on a giant uh, multi-view 3D data set, uh, specifically Objiverse and a couple other things, whatever MVIMG net is. Combination of a high capacity model and a large scale training data empowers our model to be highly generalizable and produce high quality 3D reconstructions from various testing inputs, including real world in the wild captures and images from generative models. Okay, so here they're kind of flexing here a little bit, right? Uh, a lot of times these image to 3D uh, models they really only work well if the images you're using are uh, these kind of images, right? Where it's like a, a, a single object centric thing right in the middle of the uh, image with the background that's either basically mostly white or somewhat uh, kind of consistent, right? So it's a lot easier to create uh, object 
out of a single image if the image kind of looks like this as opposed to maybe something like this dinosaur here right where it's a there's a lot more crap going on the background is kind of there's stuff in almost the foreground there's stuff in the background the background's more detailed so being able to go image to 3d using a real world image is more difficult difficult and then the even harder version is doing it from an image that comes out of a text to image model such as stable diffusion right so a generative model videos and meshes can be found on the website uh all right <laughs> i'm sick and i was wondering if it was even worth watching right now based on the stream name yeah probably not this is pretty niche content so all right, one, two, three, forty-five plus plus. Uh, recent advancements in the open world 3D object generation have been remarkable. Blah blah blah. Uh, most existing models fall short in simultaneously providing rapid generation and speeds and high fidelity to input images. Two features essential for practical applications. We present one, two, three, forty-five, an innovative method that transforms a single image into a detailed textured mesh in approximately one minute. All right, so there we go. This one seems to be taking the longest. Uh, I think we want blue as the color that we use for that. Our approach aims to fully harness the extensive knowledge embedded in 2D diffusion models. Okay, so this is another paper that's basically going to be leveraging the 2D diffusion model as the prior, right? Uh, and priors from valuable yet limited 3D data. This is achieved by initially fine-tuning a 2D diffusion model for consistent multi-view image generation. And this is a trick that people have to keep doing time and time again due to kind of this Yanis problem, which uh, we'll go into in a second here. Uh, followed by elevating these images into 3D uh, with the aid of multi-view conditioned 3D native diffusion models. Extensive experimental evaluations demonstrate that our method can produce high quality diverse 3D assets that closely mirror the original input image. Okay, and I think we're almost done. We got one more here. Instant 3D, okay. Text to 3D generation aims to synthesize vivid 3D objects from text prompts. While several existing works have achieved impressive results, they mainly rely on a time-consuming optimization paradigm. They optimize a neural radiance field from scratch for each text prompt, taking approximately one hour. This heavy and repetitive training cost impedes their practical deployment. So in this paper, they're going to basically solve this with Instant 3D. Instant 3D is able to create a 3D object in less than one second from a single run of a feed-forward network. So this is the fastest and most impressive out of all of these, right? So you have uh, this one here, which is 3D mesh in one minute. You have this one here, which is... Uh, 3D mesh from an image in five seconds, and then you have this one here, which is 30 seconds for a 3D uh, object. And the quality is, you know, it kind of tracks. So this is the 30 second one. You can see it's pretty good, you know, but it's it's a little, it's got a little weirdness in it. It's got a little bit of holes. It's not necessarily super clean. If you look at this one, this is the five second one, and looks about what you would get from five seconds right it looks kind of good but it's still not extremely high quality maybe this this stuff here is a little bit more high quality these are also cherry picked right in all of these papers the example they provide to you are not representative of the mean of the distribution they're representative of basically the best possible examples uh, even if they say they're not cherry picked they are cherry picked you know usually <laughs> that's the case this is the one that does it in one minute and it does seem like kind of the highest quality. There's still some mistakes here. You see some mistakes on the frog's hands, the astronaut here. There's definitely not a lot of detail around the arms. It's just very much a little blob, but you know, it's quite about there. And then this one, which is the fastest one, it's less than one second on a single run of a feed forward network, obviously kind of produces the lowest quality. So this is basically the lowest quality 3D uh, uh, stuff. It's not even a real mesh. This is just multi-view images. So it's multiple views of the same 3D object, but that 3D object is not in a explicit format, such as a textured mesh that we can uh, use. So we achieve this remarkable speed by devising a new network that directly constructs a 3D triplane from a text prompt. So you see again this 3D triplane, which is a very popular uh, representation for 3D that is kind of emerging. 
The core innovation relies on our exploration strategies to effectively inject text conditions into the network. Furthermore, we propose a simple yet effective activation function, the scaled sigmoid, to replace the original sigmoid. And to address the Yanis multi-head problem in 3D generation, we propose an adapt adaptive algo that it dynamically adjusts, effectively reducing the multi-head Yanis effect. Uh, extensive experiments on a wide variety of benchmarks demonstrate the proposed algorithms perform favorably against state-of-the-art methods, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so at least none of these guys are claiming state-of-the-art. This one does claim state-of-the-art, which seems a little bit grandiose to me, but uh, yeah, I would say they're all about they're all about what you would expect given the total time to generate. I'm going to grab one thing. I'll be back in a second. And I'm back. Uh, question from Vinyak. Text to image, create more synthetic data for the same image and send through a nerf. And then Christopher says, I think nerfs will go away. Yeah, I, I'm i I'm definitely on the Gaussian splat hype train. You know, I feel like the, the Gaussian splats are very good for a variety of different reasons. The composability of them is super convenient. And the more explicit nature of them allows them to kind of more easily be integrated into existing 3D platforms such as Unity, Unreal Engine, Blender, things like that. But uh, in this world of uh, text to 3D and image to 3D, right? You when you read these papers, it's like time and time again they keep coming back to these nerfs, specifically these triplane nerfs. So I don't know. You know, it, to, it could be one of those things kind of like the ConvNet and the Vision Transformer where they it's just a never-ending, eternal battle, you know, and they just keep fighting forever, you know. People still use ConvNets, and it's weird, but they still do, and they're still, every now and then you get a paper from uh, usually either Google or Meta where they basically say, hey, we trained a giant ConvNet, and it's pretty much just as good as the Vision Transformer, so... Maybe nerfs versus splats will be a battle that'll last a decade. So maybe just in case you guys don't know what a nerf is, uh, let's do a little quick summary about what is a nerf. So a nerf is a neural network that implicitly stores the information in a 3D scene. So uh, given a camera view, so given X, Y, Z, right, the position of a camera, and then theta and phi, which are the, basically the view direction, so like where the camera is looking at, so a single continuous 5D coordinate, spatial location, and viewing direction, so basically the position of a camera, or the position of an observer, you feed that into a little neural network, this F of theta, which is parameterized by uh, capital theta here, right, little multi-layer perceptron, if you will, and it'll basically give you the color and the opacity, this little sigma here, or the see-throughness, I think is a better way to think about it, at that point in space, right? So it'll basically, this little RGB uh, theta, or sigma here, is each one of these little black dots is one RGB theta, or sigma, sorry. And what this means is that you can query uh, this little neural network. You can feed any X, Y, Z, and theta phi into this, which means that you could basically go all the way around an imaginary box, right? This little voxelized space here, this box of this 3D box, and say, what does it look like from here? 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 And it'll basically always give you something, and then you can use that to basically reconstruct a 3D object. So. Nerfs are great because they're small, right? This little neural network here, f of theta, can be quite small. But the reason nerfs are bad is because you have to basically train them for every single object, right? So one nerf kind of has like a one-to-one -one, uh, mapping to one specific 3D object. And not just one specific 3D object, but one specific frozen moment in time of a 3D object. So... That, that's basically nerfs, right? It's they're they're very small and fast, but they're very slow in a and in a different way, right? They're very slow in the fact that in order to train them, and then even in order to perform inference, you have to basically uh, 
project array for every single pixel in this image, so it can get it can get quite cumbersome. Uh, okay, so that's a nerf, and then uh, specifically the type of nerf that they use in these papers are these triplane nerfs. So you see here triplane nerf, and then here in this one again, 3D triplane. So what is a 3D triplane nerf? A 3D triplane comes from this paper here. So this is Efficient Geometry Aware 3D Generative Adversarial Networks. Uh, generative Adversarial Networks are GANs. This is kind of an older technique. GANs are um, this older way of generating images there that basically uses a generator and a discriminator, basically two uh, networks that are kind of playing this game of like real versus fake. And basically they keep competing with each other until finally you create a generator network that can generate a image or whatever you want in one shot, one feed forward uh, pass. But GANs have a bunch of different problems. They're tricky to train and uh, people have kind of, they've gone out of fashion. So not a lot of GAN work going on. You can tell this paper is a little bit older, but the specifically what this paper proposed and what the other uh why it's relevant to our discussion is they proposed this uh triplane um abstraction if you want to think of it that way so a triplane and kind of the way that i think about it is it's like a type of position encoding okay so neural implicit representations aka a nerf, use fully connected layers with positional encodings to represent a scene, which can be slow to query. Okay, so you see here where it says position and direction, and those are going into this uh, positional encoding here, and then you have a bunch of fully connected layers, and then at the very end you have density and color. That is exactly what's going on here, right? You have x, y, z, which is position, you have theta and phi, which is the view, right? So there's position, direction, you can think of it as view, and then out comes density and color, right? So here's density, which is this little sigma here, and then color, which is RGB. So this is kind of what a nerf does, and they're calling that the uh, implicit representations. Implicit is because it's uh, inside the weights of a neural net, right? Uh, explicit representation would be something like a point cloud or a Gaussian splat or a uh, actual textured mesh, right? That's an explicit representation of a 3D thing. A nerf is an implicit representation of a 3D thing. Okay. Uh, represent a scene which can be slow to query. Explicit voxel grids or hybrid variant using small implicit decoders are fast to query but scale poorly with resolution. Okay, so here you have a voxel explicit or hybrid. So here you can see you've taken the 3D volume and you've basically cut it into these little subsquares. Though each of those little subsquares is called a voxel, right? You can voxelize something is basically taking something and turn it into kind of like the Minecraft looking thing of it, right? You're like making it, turning it into these smaller little squares. Uh, cutting up that space, so that's uh, explicit or hybrid. And then finally, the triplane representation, which is coming from this paper, our hybrid implicit, explicit implicit triplane representation is fast and scales efficiently with resolution, enable, enabling greater detail for equal capacity. So the triplane interpolation or triplane uh, representation, you can see here it's triplane three planes. So you can see here there's a plane uh, here, x, y, y, z, and then uh, z, x. And these three planes, you can basically take any point inside this 3D space and it'll project to some specific point on each of these planes. So you have this position corresponds to some point on the FXY, FXZ, and FYZ, and then you can just feed that position and then get the density and color, right? So what a triplane nerf is really doing is it's basically saying rather than uh, trying to train a neural network to map from a camera position, right, this camera position here, into a color and a density, let's have a more explicit representation where we basically map a specific position, specifically a position as encoded by the three points on three planes that are all orthogonal to each other, and then use that as kind of the input to the nerf, right? So it's kind of a, it's a, it makes the nerf a little bit more explicit and then also makes it uh, faster and a little bit cheaper to compute, right? So that's kind of that. I think there was one more thing I wanted to point here. Blah, 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 yeah, right here. 
Okay. Uh, three axis aligned orthogonal feature planes, right? That's kind of axis aligned orthogonal, as in they're all kind of like nice 90 degree to each other. Um, and then here there was this nice little picture where they kind of show you the quality difference. So triplane representation here versus your standard nerf. You can see it's a, it's a little bit better at the quality, specifically here on the text. So the triplane nerf is basically the new cool kid nerf. And not only is it faster, right? So relative speed ups and memory consumption compared to MIP nerf. So a triplane nerf, not only is it 2.9 times faster, but it also uses 0.32 times the memory. So it's faster, uses less memory, and it's more explicit. So that is a triplane nerf. Uh, what is this? Okay, so this is a textured mesh. So maybe just to kind of uh, mention this, right? So whenever you're playing a video game or you're doing any kind of, or watching a movie with 3D uh, with CGI, like 99.9% .9 of that is using textured meshes. Textured meshes is the legacy uh, explicit 3D format, right? It's explicit in the fact that you're storing the position of every single one of these little vertices in every single little one of these triangles. And then you're also explicitly storing uh, this, which is the texture, right? So the texture is basically a RGB image, right? It's like a three channel RGB image, just like a standard PNG or JPEG, and f you are basically, you have a specific uh, unwrap, and this unwrap is basically saying, okay, this specific part of the mesh corresponds to this specific part of the image, and that specific part of the image has this color, so you can then basically take this texture and wrap it onto the mesh, right? And this is a very explicit, there's, there's nothing implicit about this, it's all explicit, and this is basically the I call it legacy, but it's like the format that everyone uses in pretty much everything nowadays. Uh, but, of course, I think in the future we're not going to be using these kind of formats. Uh, what else do we have here? Okay, I think that's it for that. Actually, one more thing. Let's talk about the Yanis problem. So, they mentioned the Yanis problem a couple times here, right? The Yanis problem during training, reducing the multi-head effect. So, the... Yanis comes from a ancient Roman myth. It's basically a god who has two heads. He has like a head on the back of his head, kind of like a Voldemort in the original, uh, in the first Harry Potter movie, right? Where like the, the guy has like a fucking face on the back of his head and it's kind of creepy. But what, what does this have to do with 3D generation? So one of the problems that people run into is that they, they're trying to use a stable diffusion, right? A two-dimensional diffusion model as a prior to generate these 3D objects. But the problem is that those two-dimensional diffusion models, such as stable diffusion, I'm trying to find a good picture of this. Uh, yeah, sure, here you go. So those two-dimensional diffusion models almost never see the back of someone's head, right? Or another way to think about it is that they're heavily imbalanced towards the front-facing uh, part of something, right? So if you think about the data set that Stable Diffusion has been trained on, it's almost always the front of someone's face, not the back of someone's head, so that whenever you're using that diffusion model, it'll almost always generate the face of someone, not the back of their head, right? It has this bias towards a specific view. So if you're trying to use these di uh, diffusion models, these 2D diffusion models, as a, as a way to generate data for a 3D... Uh, object, creator, right? You're gonna have an issue because it's really going to prefer to generate faces. So one common problem that people run into is basically they describe the Yanis problem where you kind of always, everything has faces. Everything seems to be the front of the object and it's very difficult to get the back of the object. So that's uh, the Yanis problem. Okay. Uh, let's go back to our original paper here. And now that we've read all these abstracts, let's dive into the bottom of the introduction. The bottom of the introduction is the most important part of the introduction where they basically mention the exact uh, contributions. In sum, our main contributions are uh, a novel single stage diffusion framework that leverages multi-view 2D image diffusion models to achieve 3D generation. So single stage uh, 
refers to the fact that this isn't like a multi-stage pipeline. A lot of these computer vision pipelines and uh, generative pipelines end up being quite complicated. They have multiple steps, multiple processes. So here they're kind of advertising that not only is their method novel, as in it's new, but it's also single stage. So they're trying to tell you it's simple. Usually this is not the case, <laughs> you know. Uh, most of the time people will say their technique is novel and it's generally not. There's probably some older Schmidt Huber paper that they don't even realize uh, already did it 10 years ago. And usually it's not single stage either. Usually it's a little bit more complicated, but you know, they got to advertise their work. So leverages multi-view 2D image diffusion to achieve 3D generation. So this is kind of what we were saying where they're going to be using a pre-trained 2D diffusion model in order to basically uh, seed or start the uh, training of their 3D generation model. An LRM based multi-view denoiser. So LRM here refers to their first paper, this one here, the L large reconstruction model. Uh, that can reconstruct noise-free triplane nerfs from noisy multi-view images. So again, you see there basically the intermediate representation that they're going to be using here is going to be this triplane nerf. And then a general probabilistic approach for high quality text to 3D generation on a single image that takes about 30 seconds uh, on an A100 GPU. So there you go. Uh, can we get a little away from that? Let me Let me get away from the robot for that. That's right, we're talking to you. Wave at me. All right, that's a good boy, okay. <laughs> I just love this little robot. Uh, let's look at these figures, okay? Because this starts to get a little complicated pretty quickly, so why don't we come down here and look at what's going on here. So maybe let's understand the LRM first because that's kind of the first uh, piece of work from this research group and then from the LRM we'll go into their current work. So the overall architecture of an LRM, a large reconstruction model, a fully differentiable, fully differentiable means you can take the gradient throughout this thing, right? And why is that important? It's because if you're trying to push gradients through a set of model pieces or like architectures, right? You need to make sure that every part of that is differentiable, right? Because you're only going to be able to push gradients from some kind of loss as long as every single step all the way to the end is differentiable, which is just a fancy way of saying you can take the derivative of it, right? Because basically what we're doing is uh, gradient descent, which is basically just which way is the slope going? I'm going to go that way, right? So you need to be able to take the slope. You need to be able to take the derivative if you want to be able to push gradients and learn um, the value of parameters within your model. Uh, transformer based, right? So it's going to be using a vision transformer. So here's your VIT, vision transformer. Specifically, the one they use is Dino, and we'll go into that. Uh, encoder, decoder, encoder, decoder framework. So an encoder is something that takes a high dimensional piece of information and encodes it into a lower dimensional piece of information. And then a decoder is something that takes a lower dimensional piece of information and decodes it back into an original sized, bigger uh, piece of information. So encoders and decoders have to be trained together, right? The way that I like to think about it is that an encoder and a decoder are like two models that are basically learning to create their own language. So they learn this little language with which they can communicate to each other and the encoder is trying to compress as much as possible and the decoder is trying to reconstruct something as cleanly as possible. Right, so that's encoder decoder. Encoder decoder pattern is pretty much everywhere in machine learning, right? Your language models use an encoder decoder as well. You have encoder decoders for images, you have encoder decoders for pretty much any type of data you could think of. But specifically here, uh, they're doing an encoder decoder framework that goes from single image to a final NERF reconstruction. So the LRM applies a pre-trained vision model called Dino to encode the input image. So let's take uh, a little tangent here to what the fuck is Dino. So this is not the original Dino paper. Dino is a uh, model created by Facebook and it's basically a uh, here you go. Uh, surprisingly, the vision-only model Dino, which is not pre-trained with 
text to image alignment demonstrates promising performance, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but Dino was trained by Meta, right? It's been trained on a huge amount of data. But the reason that Dino is interesting is because different vision encoders, different vision transformers that are trained with slightly different objectives result in slightly different features, right? And that's an important thing to consider when you're trying to do uh, rec uh, image to 3D or text to 3D where you want a specific type of vision encoder or image encoder, right? And what is Dino good at? So here we have a figure from a paper. This paper is more about vision language models, but this figure is, I think, relevant because it shows you the difference between uh, the deep layers of Clip and Dino. So Clip has a vision encoder in it and the uh, or image encoder and the image encoder in Clip received gradients that are coming from this contrastive loss where the contrastive loss is basically trying to match the text associated with an image with the image itself, right? So it's kind of trying to do this semantic feature space, right? That's kind of the 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 gradients that are that are basically shaping clip are shaping it such that it kind of wants to be more semantically meaningful versus Dino V2 is some kind of masked loss, right? And Dino V2 doesn't have that kind of semantic text-based uh, loss coming through it, right? Dino is definitely much more of a pure vision type loss coming through it. So when you look at Dino versus Clip, you can see that, that Dino is just more crisp about the details, right? You can see how in Clip, right, the here for example, the, the fire compared to the fire here, right? Dino has a much higher kind of activation on only the fire and then everything else that's not the fire is very dark blue here. So uh, this is an attention map. So largely kind of what you're seeing here is how related the features are at this specific little part of the vision transformer, this specific little patch or token versus this specific little patch and token. So you can see here how Clip encodes semantic information. So maybe, uh, for example, to know that this is a fire, being able to tell that there's reflections coming off that fire makes it more useful for knowing that it's fire as in the concept of fire, right? So that's why Clip is paying a little bit more attention to the whole scene as opposed to Dino V2, which is kind of just trying to be very, very crisp about like, this is a fucking object and this is not that same object, right? So you can see here how Dino much more clean and crisp and segmented in its understanding of the world. And I guess that kind of makes it simple uh, for you guys to kind of extend that as to why you would want to use a dyno vision transformer or image encoder uh, rather than the, for example, something like a clip VIT as the image encoder. Okay, so that's why they're using the dyno uh, features. Uh, the image features are projected into a 3D triplane Im image representation by a large transformer decoder via cross attention. Okay, so here uh, I think we've skipped down to this bottom part, so let's first uh, make sure we understand this first row. So you have a single input image, right? This is a standard three-channel RGB image, 512 by 512. It's going through this convolution layer. This is largely just uh, breaking up into patches, so vision transformers can't consume an image, right? They A transformer can only consume a sequence of things, so you have to convert an image into a sequence of things, and the way that that's commonly done is you basically cut up the image into these little patches and then feed each of those little patches as if they were a sentence of little vision vision tokens. And then the vision transformer will just consume that. Here you have your standard kind of self-attention block. So self here refers to self-attention. You have a multi-layer perceptron. This is pretty uh, standard self-attention block here. And then you have probably a bunch of these stacked on. So you can see here they have 12 layers. So there's probably 12 of these stacked together end to end. And then you finally end up with these image features here. So you have a 32 by 32 by 768. So note how the channel dimension is much higher now, right? So you've kind of gone from an explicit two-dimensional image right into this uh, kind of like a latent image, which is 32 by 32. And if you were to look at this image, it wouldn't look like anything to you, right? As a human, you can understand a RGB three channel image. You can look at that and kind of know what that is. But if you were to look at this, you would have no idea what the fuck this is, right? This is basically just a bunch of numbers in this abstract tensor that isn't understandable by humans. Uh, okay. 
So those image features there, which are coming out of this VIT dyno uh, image encoder are used in now here. So you see how this says self and then this says cross. This is cross attention and then this is self attention. So this is kind of more the decoder, right? So you could think of this as the encoder, right? It's encoding the image into this little compressed uh, version of it. And then now you have a decoder that's decoding the image back into, except now rather than decoding it into an image, it's decoding it into a uh, triplane nerf. So here's that triplane. So when it's decoding it, you're also going to be adding in information. And that information that you're going to be adding in is, for example, you're going to cross attention with the encoded image features, which is pretty standard. That's what you see in the language model as well. Uh, but you also have these little camera features. So modulation with camera features. So the camera features, I think they mentioned them here. Image features are projected, followed by a multi-layer perceptron to predict the point color and density. The entire network is trained end to end on that around a million of 3D data. Okay, I guess they don't mention it. But these camera features of dimension 20 are basically, uh, you could think of it like this, right? It's like some information about the camera like the camera view, the camera angle. There's a fancy way of doing that. I don't, I didn't find it, but like uh, plucker coordinates are basically a way to assign, uh, it's a coordinate representation for a line in a projective three space, which is basically just, you could think of it like a fancy uh, version of this, right? So much kind of like the, here you have five numbers which represent a camera position and view. A plucker coordinate is kind of like the same thing, but slightly fancier where it's like, uh, you're representing a specific line or basically a specific camera pointing in a specific position in uh, six numbers rather than five. I think I think this is the paper that uses it. It might be confused. There might be another one of these papers that uses it. Maybe it's this one. I forget. One of these papers is using the plucker uh, coordinates as the camera f uh, information. But anyways, that those camera informations get fed along with the encoded version of the image into this larger decoder here. This decoder basically outputs a, a bunch of planes here. So you see how it's three by 20, 32 by 32, right? You see this first leading dimension three, and isn't that convenient? That's exactly uh, the dimension of the triplanes, right? So the way these triplanes kind of work is that you see how the output is three here, right? And each of these three planes, you basically then just re, you take those planes, then you go like, and you put them like that, right? So that's what's coming out here, is you're taking these three planes that are coming out of this decoder, and then you're basically reshaping them into this triplane representation. And then once you have this triplane nerf, then you see here how that, uh, the features at that triplane nerf for any point in space, you can feed that through your little multi-layer perceptron. Here's your little standard triplane nerf. And then you can get basically a little version of this giraffe, right? And because you can basically query every single point inside this volume, you can get a rough kind of 3D representation of this giraffe. And then you take that 3D representation of the giraffe and you get a specific view of it, right? So now you've rendered a specific view of the giraffe. And then because this entire thing is end-to-end -end differentiable, you can now start pushing gradients from here to here, right? You can basically say, hey, this decoder is supposed to take this little representation here and turn it into this image here. And this encoder, which is this part, is supposed to take this little shit here, or this image, and turn it into this representation. And because this representation should basically match this, and it should match this, these two things should be the same, and then we can just use some kind of reconstruction loss to push gradients that go all the way through here, 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 and then all the way through here. And that's how you have a end-to-end. -end. That's what they mean by trained end-to-end, -end, right? The whole thing is fully differentiable, so you can push gradients all the way from the end, all the way to the beginning, and they're training it on a million uh, different uh, 3D objects, which they mention at the very beginning uh, is coming from Obdiverse. Okay, so they basically set up this fully differentiable kind of end-to-end -end pipeline, and then they just basically push gradients from this giant-ass 3D data set, and that's basically it.
uh, Spore Gundemi with a question. I just got my Doritos and I'm watching you. I heard that you will be the new CEO of OpenAI. That's what I heard too. But then uh, Sam Altman uh, came to my house and threatened to kill my family. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm no longer looking to be the CEO of OpenAI. So maybe it's Ilya who comes to my house and threatens my family. You know, I don't know which of those two dudes is evil. <laughs> I wish I did because that would be pretty cool. But like right now, I'm not entirely certain whether Sam Altman is evil and Ilya is good or whether Ilya is evil and Sam Altman is good. You know, it's it's kind of a weird world we live in where we don't actually even know which one of those two people is the evil one. Uh, okay. So that's the LRM. And the LRM is basically the starting point for this here. Okay. So this is the diagram for the... DMV3D paper. And in this diagram, let's go a little bit further here. Here we go. Overview of our method. Uh, we denoise multiple views. Oop, oop, I'm all over the place. I'm sorry. Let's move a little bit more this way. There we go. Make it a little bit. Oh my God. I'm terrible. I'm terrible. Can we, can I, can I center this, please? Oh my god, alright, we're gonna have to make this a little bit smaller. Sorry guys, there we go. Because or else I can't I can't center it. Okay. Actually, this is the one that uses pluck arrays, so maybe I was incorrect. Maybe it's this one. So what are we starting from here? We denoise multiple views. So they're using a diffusion model to get multiple views uh, for 3D generation. Our multi-view denoiser is a large transformer model that reconstructs a noise-free triplane nerf from input noisy images with camera poses parameterized by pluck arrays. So here is the camera poses parameterized by pluck arrays. So there's your pluck arrays. Uh, and then you also have a noisy image and it's multi-view. So this is basically the same object but from three different views. Those are being fed into an image uh, encoder. Here they're calling it an image tokenizer, but it's basically the same thing, right? It's basically they're using the dyno encoder because the dyno encoder is quite good at kind of the edges and it's very clean about separating objects, which is what you would want for this type of work. And it makes it look like all three of them are going in the same dyno, but that's, or all three of them are going at the same time, but that's not the case, right? Each of these is going to be uh, turned into image tokens separately, right? So there's there's no kind of cross magic going on here, right? Uh, okay, so you have those three views. They've been turned into a compressed form of that, right? An encoded form of that, or basically now a little sequence of image tokens. Then you're going to take that sequence of image tokens and very similar to what was happening in their first paper, right? Where they're basically, they have this encoder and then they have this decoder that does cross attention with the image features in order to create a triplane nerf. This is the same thing, right? You have basically uh, the features coming in to this decoder here, this transformer decoder, which is basically doing cross attention with that. And you have a little self attention brick here. And uh, the final output of this is gonna be these triplane tokens, right? Which you can reshape in order to get this triplane representation. This arrow goes down over here. Then you reshape an unsample. You basically get your three triplanes out of that. And then now that you have your triplane nerf, you can basically get a picture from any view. So you're gonna pick, of course, the views that are what these views were so that you can then do a reconstruction loss. And here you see how this T up here and then this T minus one. This is referring to the fact that this entire process is inside a diffusion model, right? So they basically took the entire uh, LRM here and put it, made the entire thing as one step in the diffusion model, which is pretty crazy, right? They, you see how this, this gray brick here this entire thing is just one step of a diffusion model, right? T, T minus one. Diffusion models iteratively denoise. Basically, they they slowly uh, remove the noise from an image, but they do it over a bunch of steps, right? They don't just do it in one shot, like a generative adversarial network, or one shot, like a NERF, right? What they're they're doing it over multiple steps. So this is kind of interesting that they basically took their previous work and then just wrap the whole thing in a diffusion model. And now rather than kind of going from 
a known image to a known, like RGB image to RGB image, you can see here how kind of the inputs and the outputs are basically partially denoised images. So kind of a weird, uh, complicated pipeline, you know, but it's it's it works, you know, which kind of makes their whole statement here of like uh, a single stage diffusion framework, like. Eh, is it sure maybe but like this seems pretty complicated i think the whole advertising something is single stage you're trying to say that it's simple but this is, doesn't seem super simple okay during inference we render denoised images at input viewpoints and combine them with inputs to obtain less noisy net less noisy inputs for the next denoising step we output the clean triplane nerf at the final denoising step enabling 3d generation okay so at the very end, you get this clean triplane nerf, so you can then use that clean triplane nerf to generate your uh, 3D uh, stuff. Okay. Now let's go into here. So this is the 1, 2, 3, 45. So 1, 2, 3, 45, let's look at their figure diagram. These are These are like... I love these, you know, I love how complicated these are, and then you got to get to pick them apart and break them into all their pieces, and then you kind of start to understand it, and then it all kind of makes so much more sense. You know, this is the joy of reading computer vision papers. Okay, starting with a single RGB image as input, we initially produce consistent multi-view images by fine-tuning a 2D diffusion model. Okay, so remember how earlier we talked about this Yanis problem, how these 2D diffusion models, like stable diffusion, are very biased towards the front of something, right? It's going to be difficult to create the back of this little plushy head, or little plushy dragon toy, right? So what they're going to do is they're going to fine-tune a 2D diffusion model so that it gives you more consistent multi-view images, right? So they're basically going to take a pre-trained uh, diffusion model, like stable diffusion, and then fine-tune it on a data set, right? The data set is coming from basically a uh, more three explicit 3D data set like this, right? But they're they're not using that to train the full thing. They're using that to basically uh, make this uh, or fine tune this stable diffusion model such that it can generate these multi view images, right? This like bottom up angle, this top down angle. Here they're using uh, the clip uh, text encoder for the I guess global 2D feature. Okay, so here they're using both. So re actually, that's this is kind of cool. So remember how here, right, we were saying that the clip uh, image encoder, the clip vision transformer, is good at semantic concepts versus the dyno image encoder is good at kind of object separatedness and kind of uh, segmentation, kind of cleanliness, maybe it would be one way to describe it. So they're actually using both. So if you can actually see they have the little ice symbol here means that it's frozen so they're not pushing gradients into dyno v2 or clip those are frozen as it's called but they're using the uh, semantic encoded image so the encoded image that's going through the clip right so now it's more semantic -y. and then the encoded image of these multi views so multiple of these multi views going into dyno v2 and then you get uh, kind of more objecty uh, features so you're conditioning uh, the magic of this paper, which is a new 3D ConvNet, uh, a new 3D uh, diffusion model. So here you have a 2D diffusion model, stable diffusion. You're using that to generate multi-view images. You're also taking the original RGB image, feeding it through clip. Then you're using the uh, encoded clip image and the encoded Dino V2 multi-view images to basically condition a... Uh, 3D diffusion model, which they're calling uh, a 3D occupancy diffusion model, right? Multi-view conditioned 3D occupancy diffusion. Okay, so conditioned refers to the fact that you're conditioning this unit on uh, both the Dino V2 features and the clip features, so semantic -y features and then object -y features. And then the occupancy refers to the fact that the output of this is not a, a colored... Uh, point cloud or something like that. It's an occupancy volume, right? So you see here the dimensionality of this is 64 by 64 by 64. So the output of this is basically ones and it's basically saying like there's something here, there's nothing here. If you actually zoomed in, it looks kind of voxelized, kind of like a Minecraft, right? So it's really just an occupancy 
uh, grid, if you want to think of it that way, where it's basically saying there's there's stuff here and then there's not stuff here. It's basically deciding what is object and what is not object, right? And then there's a different uh, 3D diffusion model. In this case, this one is uh, also multi-view condition, right? You're also getting in the, the semantic eclipse features coming in, and then you're also getting the Dino V2 object -y features coming in. But so that's where the multi-view conditioning is coming from. But now it's uh, it's not doing just 3D occupancy. It's it's uh, making it more sparse. So you're going from 64 by 64 by 64 to 128 by 128 by 128, and you can see they're they're achieving by by subdividing. So they're basically doubling every single voxel here. But the problem with that is you're going to end up with a huge amount of crap in this, right? So in order to do that, they're going to have to kind of sparsify it a little bit, and then here you go. Actually, I don't even know if they sparsify this. I think SDF plus RGB. SDF is signed distance function, and then RGB is red, green, and blue. So I think the final output of this, you're going to end up with that for every single voxel in here, right? Every single voxel inside this 128 by 128 by 128 is going to have a color, and then it's also going to be, it's also going to tell you, uh, let's get a picture for a signed distance function. Signed distance function. A signed distance function. I think this is a good picture. Let's do this one. So a signed distance function is a function that tells you how far away you are from uh, an edge, right? So here's a signed distance function. Here you have a line. Pretend this line is like the boundary of an object, right? The boundary of this armadillo or the boundary of this rabbit, right? The signed distance function will basically tell you how far away you are from that, right? So and the signed, right, the S in that refers to the fact that it's signed as in the fact it'll tell you whether you're inside the mesh or outside the mesh. So here's a sign, right? It'll be positive outside of the object and then negative inside of the object, right? So if you're way inside the object, it'll be a big negative value. If you're way outside the object, it'll be a way big positive value. So here, SDF plus RGB, that's that's what's coming out of this sparse comp unit. It's for every single one of these 128 by 128, you're getting a color, an RGB, and then you're also getting a value for the SDF, which is basically telling you, am I way inside this dragon or am I way outside this dragon? And then once you have that information, you can then use the marching cubes algorithm, which is a, uh, we've gone over it before, but this is kind of an older, uh, look at this, 1987 SIGGRAPH algorithm. And it's basically a way to take a sine distance function and a within a voxelized space and turn it into a mesh. So that's how they take it that very last step, right, into a textured 3D mesh. So the textured 3D mesh, which we went over earlier, right, is this. So once you can turn something into a textured 3D mesh, then you can import it into all your favorite Unity, Unreal, whatever you want. So this is really the format that you want at the very end. And uh, they give us some more information here. The generated multi-view images act as essential guiding conditions, right? So they're being used to condition these two different uh, 3D diffusion models here. After extracting the 3D mesh from the denoise volume, we further enhance the texture by employing a lightweight optimization with multi-view images as supervision. Okay, so I guess they have one extra step here as well. So they're taking, in order to get the texture, so this right here gives them the mesh, but they also want the texture, right? They want this, they want the PNG that'll wrap onto the mesh. And in order to get the PNG that'll wrap onto the mesh, they have some extra step here, this red line that goes from the multi-view images. Uh, and 12345 plus plus is capable of producing a mesh within 20 seconds and then delivers the refined mesh after one minute. So within 20 seconds, you get basically this. And then uh, after another minute, you get through the second conf net. And of course, this one's going to be much bigger. You see how this 3D, 3D convolutional unit for a 3D occupancy diffusion model, you can see how this one is much lower resolution and this one is higher resolution, which is why this one takes basically twice as long. It takes something like 40 seconds versus this one takes 20 seconds. So that is that. Uh, okay, consistent multi-view generation, right? So they mentioned that in order to create consistent multi-view images, they need to fine-tune 
the 2D diffusion model, right? The 2D pre-trained diffusion model, like stable diffusion, is not good at generating weird angles of things, right? So in order to do that, they're going to fine tune it. So how are they gonna fine tune it? We stitch multi-view images into a single frame and then fine tune the stable diffusion model to generate this composite image using the input image reference uh, as conditions. We utilize predetermined absolute elevation angles and relative azimuth angles. Okay, so they're, these are hard-coded angles. And most of these 3D reconstruction papers use hard-coded angles like this. So you see this very uh, rounded, even numbers here, 30 degrees. This is basically, if you have the object, it's like, how far are you above like this? And then uh, the kind of like rotation like this, right? So normally for uh, representing an, an arbitrary 3D or 3D rotation in space, you need uh, something like a quaternion, you know, you need something more like four numbers, but in this paper, really, they just want azimuth and elevation, which is why they can get away with just those two numbers, and that's the same uh, thing happens in NERFs, right? NERFs are encoding a camera view with just two uh, kind of angle uh, pieces of information. During 3D reconstruction, we don't need to infer the elevation angle of the input image. Okay, so you're taking your pre-trained stable diffusion unit here, local condition, reference attention. Okay, somehow that's being used to condition a larger stable diffusion unit, which is fine-tuned, and this larger stable diffusion unit, which is fine-tuned, is actually the one that's producing this weird tiled multi-view image. So kind of a weird choice there, but rather than basically fine-tuning this uh, unit or this stable diffusion model here to produce a single image they fine-tune it to produce all six images at once right in this tiled image and that seems kind of weird but it actually makes sense the reason they do that is because if they produced each multi-view image individually they would have to wait for six inference steps right they would basically have to run this six times for each of the six multi-view images but Rather than doing that, if they're going to fine-tune this diffusion model anyways, might as well fine-tune it to just output the six views in one image so that you only need to basically do one sh one inference of the unit, of the stable diffusion unit. And it's that's not even entirely correct because the stable diffusion unit is doing many inferences because it has that, uh, as a diffusion model, it has multiple time steps. So they're saving themselves on the uh, diffusion unit speed uh, to get these multi-view images by generating this tiled image. But one thing that actually I thought about this is that we actually reviewed a paper, I think it was last week, where uh, the consistency models, right, where people figured out uh, a LoRa that you could add to the stable diffusion model that would make it significantly faster, which means you can generate images in much lower, much less amounts of steps. So maybe they could put that in here, right, and they could generate uh, more or better multi-view images from a stable diffusion model that has this latent consistency model LoRa attached to it. So kind of cool that like, you know, like this is always the case, but it's, it is kind of cool that like if you read a lot of papers from a variety of different uh, backgrounds in different research areas, you start realizing that, hey, this idea from this other research area, right, from the 2D kind of stable diffusion world, we could be applying it here to the 3D uh, text to Im or text to 3D world or the image to 3D world. So definitely improvements to be found. Uh, actually, look at this. <laughs> the fine tuning is itself done with a LoRa, which means they could easily combine it with the LCM LoRa. Pretty crazy. Fine tuning process took uh, about. 10 days on 16 GPUs. So, you know, I don't have 16 GPUs that will run for 10 days. I couldn't do this. All right, let's look more at this multi-view local condition here. Actually, maybe pause for a second. Let's see what you guys have to say. A question from Coco. Why do they switch from occupancy to SDF? Is it more efficient to exporting it as a mesh. Yeah, I think the SDF is so that they can do the uh, marching cubes. 
Do they optimize the UV map directly or fine tune the sparse unit and the color refinement? So uh, what Coco is referring to there is the UV map is uh, oftentimes this. So people will call this the, the UV map. It basically maps uh, kind of the wrapping, right? The wrapping of the texture onto the mesh. That's kind of what he's meaning by the UV map. I don't actually know. I didn't, I haven't read this paper. Like just being honest here, guys, I like skimmed through these papers a little bit, but I haven't actually read it. So I don't know how, what this red line goes through. I think, I think if we scroll here, eventually we'll find texture refinement and they'll give us the details. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Given that multi-view images possess high resolution, we can refine the texture through the lightweight optimization. We fix the geometry of the generated mesh while optimizing a color field represented by a tensor RF, tensor, tensor. This is a tensor nerf. It's like a, a different type of nerf. In each iteration, the uh, mesh is rendered to 2D by rasterization and querying the color network. We leverage the generated multi-view images to guide the texture optimization using a L2 loss. Jesus Christ. We bake the optimized color field onto the mesh with the surface normal serving as the viewing direction. Dude, what the fuck? Okay, so this is quite complicated. So, so they make it look very clean and they take this little red line and they're like, and then it just magically refines the texture. But it seems like it's a lot more involved and kind of a little bit intense here. So using the surface normal of the mesh. So the surface normal is basically you have the nor the surface, right? And the sine distance function is telling you the distance to that surface. But that surface also has a normal, which is basically the vector that, that sticks out of that surface at a perfect kind of uh, orthogonal kind of perpendicular a little vector sticking out and then you use that surface normal as the viewing direction for a tensor and the tensor is you could think of it kind of like this right but slightly more fancy where you have a specific viewing direction it'll give you that color dude that's gross like you know what i'm saying like this is this is fucking gross <laughs> okay um is there any other pretty pictures in here that we can look at yeah we were looking at this one we employ a pre-trained 2D backbone to extract 2D patch features for each view. These features are then aggregated using known projection matrices to construct a 3D feature volume. The volume is further processed by 3D convolutional neural networks, resulting in feature volumes of varying resolutions. Subsequently, these volumes are concatenated with the corresponding feature volumes within the diffusion unit to guide the 3D diffusion. So this is the 3D sparse diffusion unit, which is the first one here, right? So they have two different 3D units or 3D diffusion units. Both of them are using convolutions, right? 3D convolutions. Convolutions, you can do it in 3D, you can do it in 2D. But I, I feel like we need to have like a 3D VIT. Someone needs to make a VIT, but the 3D version of that so that we don't need to be using 3D uh, sparse convolutions here. But anyways, here uh, you're conditioning at various points in this unit and you're conditioning it on the specific multi-view patch features which are coming from specific flat views with some kind of hard-coded matrix here, known projection matrices, which are probably the same ones over and over again, just so they don't need to keep calculating it. That would be my guess. Average concat. Uh, okay, so you see here the feature volumes get increasingly more and more sparse. So you start with a 64 by 64 by 64, then 32 by 32 by 32, and then 4 by 4 by 4. And you can see here how the 64 by 64 by 64 is used to condition the unit here at the beginning while it's still very wide, and here at the end while it's wide. But the 4 by 4 by 4, which is much smaller, is only used to condition, here you see this arrow comes here, it's only used to condition the middle part of this unit where it's very uh, narrow but deep, right? So a unit is wide and big at the beginning and end, and then at the middle it's kind of like the choke point or the bottleneck and it becomes very small but also very deep in terms of the uh, kind of feature space, right? Okay, 
And what do we have here? We have some examples. Why don't we go to the other papers, though? Yeah, I wanted to talk about this paper because this paper was pretty fucking crazy. So this is the one instant text to 3D generation. This is the one that does it in like less than one second. And the quality isn't great. You know, like this quality is pretty trash. Like the 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 kind of uh, t text part of it is nice. So the fact that you can, it is good about the text, right? So koala sitting on books wearing a cape, but like the, in terms of the actual final thing, like this is just nowhere near what the other papers have. But the one thing that they do here, which is kind of interesting is this. So overview of proposed instant 3D, which applies a conditional decoder network. So the same thing, you have a decoder that is conditioned on something, as all decoders are, I guess, to map a text prompt to a corresponding triplane. So again, we see this triplane nerf coming again. Everybody loves their triplane nerfs. Three condition mechanisms, i.e. cross attention, style injection, and token to plane transformation are seamlessly combined to bridge text in 3D, tackling the issue of weak supervision from SDS. This is score distillation sampling, which is a type of reconstruction loss, I think, something like that. It's a type of reconstruction loss that's supposed to be more semantic, if I remember correctly. Okay. Given a random camera pose, a 2D image is rendered from the conditional triplane through coordinate-based feature sampling, point density, and albedo prediction. Uh, albedo is basically just RGB. Uh, differentiable volume rendering. For albedo activation, we propose a scaled sigmoid function accelerating the training conversions. Let's look at this. Scaled sigmoid function. Okay. So you see this little sigmoid, which is your little s, you can scale it, you can change it, right? See that? So they have, I guess, a sigmoid that is more steep so that it can train faster. Cool. That probably fucks it up in some other way that they don't really understand, but you know, I guess it worked out kind of in the alchemy of machine learning. Sometimes you do weird shit and it works. And this paper is the uh, king of weird shit because the one weird thing that they did here that I thought was weird is that they feed the text a rabbit wearing a backpack into the clip text encoder so this is not the clip image encoder right clip is both a text encoder and an image encoder here they're using the clip text encoder but then the clip text encoder right it's going to convert a sequence it's a sequence and then it'll output a sequence of basically tokens that represent this text but the first one here they call it class embedding and i was like what and then I dug a little deeper, and they do mention it here. They're like, the text encoder for clip generates both class and token embeddings for a prompt. The class embedding contains sentence-level semantic information. The token embeddings contain rich and semantic details of the prompt, word level, which can better represent items in a scene and are commonly used in text image generation. We aim for the generated 3D objects to reflect all mentioned entities, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, is that actually the way that it works like does the clip text encoder actually give you a class token and then a bunch of other tokens or is this basically attention sinks all over again so or vit register so there's a, a couple different papers uh we read vit registers but then there's also this other people called attention six and both of those papers basically bring attention to the fact that inside a transformer model, usually that first token in the sequence is being used to pack a bunch of information. So basically, the the models have this, the transformer models have this emergent behavior where they will put a bunch of extra information that is global in nature into that first token, right? And the, in the VIT registers paper, uh, they realize that in some of these background tokens, right, so in some of uh, the tokens in the background, which are kind of low quality, the VIT was packing global information into it. So here, now all of a sudden, you have someone taking the output of a clip text encoder and assuming that the first token is a global kind of class embedding, which is kind of, you could think of it like the, if you're, uh, if you have a rabbit wearing a backpack, right, these tokens here the ones after might be more representative of kind of like lower, more lower, lower, uh, lower type features that are a little bit more local, right? That's the word I was looking for. So 
Uh, the backpack is green. There's a blue strap. Like there's an ear. It's it has a black eye. Right. Like those are the kind of like kind of low level local type features that would be in the rest of these uh, tokens that are coming out of the clip text encoder. But that first token, if the kind of attention sink emergent behavior theory is correct, is probably going to be more global information. So they do this kind of very clever loss here where they take that first token and then, right, they go through their whole bullshit, which we'll go through, but their, their output is going to be an image. And then they're going to take that image, feed it through the clip image encoder as well. And then that first one there, right, is also going to be the same. So basically what they're saying is that the first token in the clip image encoder and the first token in the clip text encoder are what are called class tokens, which are representing this kind of global information of like what is actually in this image and what is actually in this text. And then they're using a cosine distance loss between those. <laughs> so that is some crazy shit. You know, when I saw that, I was like, one, I didn't know you could do that. And two, the fact that this works is kind of crazy but pretty badass and like you know it's kind of cool yeah yeah there are like clip itself was trained to make this and this the same right like so it's not like it's not like the like clip is contrastively trained which means they're literally pushing a loss that is based on a basically a distance between what's coming out of here and what's coming out of here but the fact that they're taking only the first one that's kind of the cool part okay is that proven that it works i mean kind of you know maybe maybe we don't know maybe it literally makes it worse but it does seem like it makes a difference they have uh, some stuff here so cross attention plus style injection i think they have an ablation study i'm not exactly sure somewhere over here but these people are pretty avant-garde they do some other tricky stuff and here's the other tricky stuff that they do so okay you have this token to plane which is also kind of weird right so they take the tokens that are coming out of this text and they just turn it into a plane specifically a triplane right? and i'm like i'm like wait a second this is a sequence text tokens like how the how the hell are you turning a sequence of text tokens into a triplane right and i like i dug in i dug in and it's like what's going on and they're like we further apply an mlp to refine the token embeddings and then reshape them into a feature map with the shape of eight by eight the token to plane transformation not only transforms the sequential tokens into a desired planar shape but also shifts the clip embeddings into a feature space suitable for text to 3d generation so they basically just did it. They're you know, saying they basically took a sequence of text information and they were like, what if we just take that sequence of text information and we just reshape it so it's 2D and now it's a plane? And I'm like, wait a second, you can't do that. That's 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 fucking illegal. Like you can't do that. That, that doesn't make any sense. And then I was like, wait a second. That's exactly what we did anyways. Like that's how vision transformers work, right? So and whenever people designed a vision transformer, they're like, what if we just took an image, which is a plane, and we just turned it into a sequence of things and then we just fed that sequence of things into a transformer and pretended that that was an image. And guess what? Vision transformers work. So this paper is basically doing the same thing but in the opposite way. They're like, what if we just take a bunch of text information, which is a sequence of text information, and just reshape it into a 2D plane and then just pretend that it's a plane type thing. It, pretend that it's an image. And guess what? It works. Which is weird. But it does. <laughs> So, I don't know, this paper, like, the results aren't that amazing on this paper, and it's, it, this is, like, some random ass, like, I don't know what Skyward, this is, like, some random Chinese startups, Singapore startup, like, some random Singapore AI company, but, like, there, that's two different things that they did here, this class embedded token thing, and then the, the straight up token to plane, like, that's two different tricks here that they did that, from a high level, don't make any sense, but then when you dig in a little deeper, you're like, wait a second, that's actually genius, and... I think to me, I'm going to take this opportunity to say that a lot of machine learning is like this, right? So a lot of times the ideas that matter in machine learning are not intuitive or sometimes even seem wrong at the beginning, right? So like uh, even the transformer architecture, right? 
the even before that if you go to the the whole idea of like AlexNet or even neural nets right where it's like hey let's just feed a bunch of images into a giant neural net right like those ideas if you were to present them in the in the time people would have said that doesn't make any fucking sense that's a stupid idea and then it ends up working out so I kind of these are kind of like triggering that same thing in me where I like initially I read this and I'm like this doesn't make any fucking sense like I don't think you can do that and then it turns out that it just it works fine right and so maybe that's kind of like a, a, a life lesson for all of us that like we should be a little bit more willing to do weird things such as this token to plane where you just take a sequence of text clip tokens and then or clip text tokens and then just reshape them into a plane and see if that works right so I don't know I thought that was kind of interesting but anyways, once they get this uh, triplane representation right, then they can uh, feed that into their little nerf here. Here's your little nerf. Your nerf is going to output. They use albedo and density. Albedo and density is just a different way of saying uh, color and then uh, opacity. So opacity, density, transparency, all of those are basically the same thing. And then uh, color... Uh, and opa or albedo, those are all words for the same thing. So it depends on where you come from. Generally, albedo means that this is like a 3D person. So uh, somebody who's familiar with like textured meshes uh, knows a word like albedo and they'll use a word like albedo. But someone who's not familiar with that kind of 3D world, they're just going to say RGB or like color, right? So the fact that they use the word albedo tells me that this is more of like kind of a, a 3D person, somebody who knows about 3D. But anyways, then once you have that, you can use your standard volume rendering to get a little 2D uh, image, and then you can use that 2D image to basically do your score distillation sampling, which is like basically like your standard kind of reconstruction loss, make this image look like this image, and then you have your uh, this weird clip loss that they use here. But pretty badass. Uh, let's see. Figure four, illustration of our style injection module, which takes token embeddings extracted via the clip text encoder as input while incorporating Gaussian noise into the generative style vector. Yeah, this is another weird one. So look at this. Uh, you take your token embeddings. So this is just basically your text tokens that are coming out of your clipped, uh, clip text encoder. You're projecting them. Okay, boom. Here you have your standard uh, multi-headed self-attention. You have a uh, standard little... Uh, multi-layer perceptron after that you have your uh, norms here right pre-norm as opposed to post-norm it used to be that these norms were put at the end now they're put at the beginning but then they also do this weird kind of like nonsensical reshape uh concat so they literally take the vector that comes out of this which is again supposed to be a sequence of text information they concatenate gaussian noise and like literally like this you see how this uh uh, brown part is in the back and then this blue part is in the front and they just concatenate that and they're just, they're, we're just going to call that the style vector. And it's like, what? <laughs> but, hey, it works. So <laughs> who are we to, to shit on them, you know? And then here is the one that I was kind of most impressed by, this random like starting from clip text embeddings and then just reshaping it into a plane so that you can use it as a triplane uh, mesh or triplane nerf, sorry. I guess here is their stretch sigmoid. So here's the original sigmoid with its stretched variant and the proposed scale sigmoid function. The scaled sigmoid function possesses a broader high gradient region which accelerates training. Ooh, this is kind of cool. Okay, so why is the broader uh, sigmoid result in faster training? So when you're training a neural net, right, you're performing gradient descent, and what you're doing is you're, you're looking at where the slope is, and then you're basically saying, let me go that way, right? So you're changing the value of these little weight parameters, and if the slope is very flat, you're not going to change the parameter very much, right? So like if your gradient is small, that means you're just taking a very small little step, right? And the learning rate is kind of you could think of the learning rate as like the size of your step that you're taking whenever you're going down that hill, right? So if the hill isn't very steep, even if you take a a, a, a big step, you're just going to take a little, you're just going to change a little bit, right? You're change that weight a little bit. But by pitching the sigmoid like this, you're making the actual values that flow out bigger in magnitude, which means you're going to take bigger steps, which is going to then overall 
mean you train faster. Again, I think this is kind of a cool idea, but I feel like there's a bunch of red light indicators just like flashing in my head. It's like this is going to be more unstable. It might lead to kind of more issues. Like, I don't know, it just it just feels like another one of those things that I'm like, that doesn't seem like you should just be able to do that. And then in this paper, they just do. So, I don't know, this, this paper, like 100 in terms of like doing weird random shit that like should be illegal, but like somehow magically works. <laughs> it works, but maybe some of their assumptions are not 100% correct. Yeah, maybe they like kind of cancel out in like a weird way and that's why the whole thing works, but... I thought that was cool. It definitely had me like kind of like scratching my head. Uh see if there's anything here. Okay, no specific questions. All right, let's go back to our uh these other papers here because I think these are more this one isn't really in competition for state of the art, right? Like these guys don't even try to pretend they're state of the art, but like these two are, right? This these guys claim that they're state of the art this Adobe group, but I would say it's a little bit closer than they th say it is. So here we have qualitative results of various single image to 3D approaches. And this is again the uh, 12345, which is basically Tsinghua, UCLA, Stanford. It's like kind of like Chinese universities and then uh, uh, West Coast American universities. So UCLA, UC San Diego and Stanford are all West Coast versus this one here is uh, Adobe uh, HKU, that might be Hong Kong, also Stanford, so I guess everything is fucking West Coast in China anyways, right? Like Asia Pacific region and the West Coast of the US is basically where all of this magic is happening. Everybody else is just sitting around. But okay, let's compare some of these. Uh, so actually, interesting here, they're comparing to 1, 2, 3, 45. So this is 1, 2, 3, 45 plus plus. So, you know, they're already outdated there with their comparisons. But we got one minute. We got Dream Gaussian, which takes two minutes. We got Sync Dreamer, which takes six minutes. We got the original 1, 2, 3, 45, which takes 45 seconds. We got Shape E. Shape E is the one that's Alec Radford uh, open AIs, right? So this one's quite famous as well. And then we have Dream Fusion. So none of these are like amazing to be honest. It feels like Dream Fusion, which takes 30 minutes, has like the highest quality. You know, but this one for one minute this is pretty good. Let's compare it to this one here. Yeah, you're still losing the details. So here you're getting a little bit of this Yanis problem, right? So specifically bad with this bear. You can see how the, the kind of the back of the bear is nonsense because it doesn't know how to draw the back of a bear. A little bit cleaner, but still mostly rough. I don't know. I still feel like we have room to go. I feel like when I think about the year 2030, right? It's like 2030, we're all sitting in our VR headsets and we're basically just in this AI utopia what is the th text, what is the speech to 3D model that exists, right? So whenever you're sitting in that VR headset in the future, you're going to be able to do basically speech to 3D. You're going to be able to say, uh, generate this, and, and your headset will generate it for you. But what is going to be going on there? I feel like it's going to be some kind of diffusion, 3D diffusion model that uses Gaussian splat. So s the combination of 3D diffusion models, and but not these convolutional based 3D diffusion models. I think it's going to be a transformer based 3D diffusion model that uh, uses Gaussian splats rather than uh, nerfs and sign distance functions and textured meshes, right? I feel like nerfs, even the triplane nerfs, sign distance functions and textured meshes, all of those are just dead. They're not dead because people obviously keep using them and I might be wrong and they might be the thing in the future, but to me, they just don't feel like the right solution. To me, the Gaussian splats just seem like the way to go. So basically, if you did this paper with the Gaussian splat, that's where I feel like uh, the future is. But that's that's just my opinion. But hey, maybe that's why you tune into this uh, these YouTube live streams is because you want my personal opinion, not necessarily what uh, these guys think. 
Uh, okay, let's keep going here. Google Cloud and Lambda Labs. Google Cloud provides a bunch of money. Dude, there's so many sh weird shit. Like, that's someone to see one of the like cooler things you can do. It's like at the very end of the papers, they'll always talk about acknowledgements and they'll tell you sometimes you can read into this and you can figure out who did what. So like here, I guess they don't mention it, but like sometimes they'll literally tell you who paid for the computing and, you, and there's like weird, interesting kind of situations where like Google's paying for stable diffusions or what was it? We found out that Google pays uh, hugging faces bill sometimes like Google paid for all the hugging face whisper distillation work, which was kind of weird. This is too zoomed in. I can't even tell what's going on anymore. Here you have the famous Nerf Tonka truck. This little Tonka truck, which comes from the original Nerf paper, is very famous right now. It's very, it's kind of one of the benchmarks. Let's see, acknowledgement. Providing testing images from Sync Dreamer. Okay, they don't really mention who paid for their stuff. Let's keep going though. We need to find cool, new, interesting things. Here we have more comparisons. Point E. Shape E, they're not comparing to the latest one, two, three, forty-five, which I guess is why they can claim state of the art. This one looks terrible. Ooh, what is this one? This one looks super clean. Oh, this is ours. Yeah, look at that. Damn, that multi-view really coming in strong there to get all of that. Okay. What do we got here? Experiment details. Our experiments are implemented in PyTorch. Okay, that's probably the most popular AI framework right now, so that kind of makes a ton of sense. Adam W, most popular optimizer, so everything's pretty standard so far. Architecture of the text condition model closely conditions that of the image condition models, with the primary distinction being the approach to injecting the condition signal. For text condition models, we employ the clip text encoder. Okay, pretty standard. Integrating them into our denoiser through the cross-attention layer is also pretty standard. In each transformer block, the new cross-attention layer is introduced between the original attention and the FFN. Okay, so they're basically... Is this the one that did the LORAs? Yeah, I think this is the one that did the little LORAs. So they're adding extra cross-attention layers in order to not mess with the original pre-trained models. We adopt a classifier-free guidance approach, which we keep seeing over and over again. It seems to be kind of standard. God, my nose is so itchy. Uh, encoder, decoder. So the encoder, right, has the raw information and then the decoder takes the raw information and then outputs the original information again. But in this case, the encoder uh, output or takes in the image, outputs the uh, encoded image, the decoder takes the encoded image, this 32 by 32 by 3, and then outputs the triplane. Right, so the triplane is going to be three uh, feature planes of dimension uh, 32 by 32, and I guess 32 is the depth. Morel use, what else? The diffusion schedule, so this is the the noise that gets added and removed inside the multi-step diffusion process usually has some scheduling on it. I feel like usually the diffusion schedule is linear. So this is interesting, the fact that it's not. 1,000 time steps. This is a little typo here. I think this should be time step, not times steps. But 1,000 is the high end. For example, the latent consistency models do it in like four steps. So they basically take it from 1,000 steps to four steps, which is way smaller. I think 1,000 steps is a little bit egregious. That's going to kind of take forever. Trained on 32 GPUs for four days or 128 GPUs for seven days. So this is not, this is not like a random little researcher in some academic lab. This is big boy GPU numbers, which makes sense. It's Adobe, right? They got a ton of money, so they got some big boy GPU budgets. What else? Mm. 
multi-view diffusion. The original x naught distribution addressed in 2D diffusion models is the single image distribution in a data set, right? Which we said is biased towards that frontal view. So, right, they want to turn that into this, like, multi-view uh, situation that doesn't have that bias, which in this paper they achieve that by fine-tuning the diffusion model so that it outputs these multi-view images. Come on, load. Okay, I don't know why it's not loading. Uh, each set are image observations from the th same 3D scene from a set of viewpoints. The diffusion process is equivalent to diffusing each image independently with the same noise schedule. Okay, so actually this is a difference, right? So in this paper, right, they do, they fine tune this diffusion model so that it outputs all of the views in one shot, right? It outputs all of them at once into this multi-view image, but in this paper, they diffuse each image independently. So I feel like this is probably gonna result in better quality, right? You're gonna get a higher quality because each one is done independently, but you're gonna miss out on some of the speed here that you get from just doing it in a tiled form, which is probably why this one's a little bit faster. One minute, and this one is what? No, I think this one is faster, 30 seconds. Yeah, so this one's faster for other reasons. So it could have been even faster if they would have done that tiling trick. The reverse of the 2D diffusion process is effectively denoising. We propose 3D reconstruction and rendering to achieve 2D multi-view image denoising. We leverage a 3D reconstruction module E to reconstruct a 3D representation S from the noisy multi-view images and render denoised images in a differentiable rendering module R, right? So if you want anything that's end-to-end -end trainable, you're going to be, uh, you're going to require that every part of your system is differentiable and that's why your rendering needs to be differentiable, but luckily there is a uh, ways of rendering uh, 3D, or rendering images from uh, nerf representation that is differentiable, right? So here's your rendering loss there. You wouldn't be able to do that if you couldn't uh, push gradients through the actual rendering step, which I think is this uh, little arrow here. <laughs> Look at this. Okay, so the loss for reconstruction, look at this, look at how many functions inside functions you have. So you have the conditioning, uh, what is C? C is probably somewhere over here. C is the camera maybe, so maybe the camera, the conditioning, the time step, the image, right? So now you have an encoder, then you have the rendering of the encoder, and then you have the loss on the rendering of the encoder, and that's the reconstruction loss. Our framework is general and potentially any 3D representation can be applied. We consider triplane nerfs, but you could actually probably do this with a different thing, so maybe that's something. camera conditioning. So this is also kind of interesting, right, where these are the guys that ended up parameterizing it as plucker coordinates. So I think there's probably more work to be done here as well, right? In the original Nerf paper, they kind of like just naively use x, y, z, theta, phi. That's also what they're using here, right? They're also just basically using the azimuth elevation. But you're conditioning on this camera information, you might as well try to find a type of camera information that is a little bit more rich or structured in some specific way. So here, for example, you could feed in the entire camera intrinsic and extrinsic matrices, but those are going to be big. That's a lot of numbers. You probably don't need that many numbers, and they're probably kind of unnecessarily confusing and not particularly structured. So maybe these this like weird plucker coordinate is the way to represent and feed camera information into uh, or use it for conditioning these diffusion models. 
requires an effective design of input camera to facilitate the model's understanding. A basic strategy uses the ADA layer norm zero block on the camera parameters. However, we find that conditioning on camera and time simultaneously within the same strategy tends to weaken the effects with these two conditions. Instead, we propose a novel approach, parameterizing cameras with a set of pixel-aligned rays, in particular following this, so I guess these guys deserve credit for this original plucker coordinate, where O and D are the origin and direction of a pixel ray computed from the camera parameters, and X denotes the cross product. Okay, so it's basically the ray that goes through the from the origin to the camera, and then the ray that goes in the direction so basically you have a ray that goes from here, the origin of the space to the camera, and then you have the actual ray, and then the plucker coordinate is basically the cross product of this ray and that ray with the other ray. So it's six numbers total, right? This is going to be three-dimensional, and then the cross product between these is just going to be another orthogonal ray, which is also going to be three-dimensional. So the, your uh, camera information is six numbers total and those six numbers are going to be better than the five numbers that they use here, better than the two numbers that they use here, and then better than the, uh, if you were to use the camera intrinsic, which is like a three by four or a four by four, and then the extrinsic is also a four by four or a three by four. So, I don't know, maybe these plucker coordinates are the way to go. Achieving effective camera conditioning. Okay, image conditioning. What do we got here? We uniformly sample time steps t within the range one over t and add noise according to a cosine schedule. This is this is what I was saying. I don't think that's standard. I think the noise of a stable diffusion model is generally linear, right? You're generally just decreasing the amount of noise as you get closer to the time step zero. Cosine schedule means it's like going up and down. More noise, less noise, more noise, less noise, more noise, less noise. So is that an original idea or did they take this from somewhere else or am I just completely unaware of the fact that there's a lot more cosine noise schedules than I think there is? I don't know. Maybe one of you guys knows that. Do we have uh, any stable diffusion Andes in the chat? Minimize the following training objective with conditioning signal Y. We select four viewpoints that uniformly surround the object in a circle to ensure good coverage. So again, this is the same. I feel like we need to get away from this uh, shit, that this is happening here too, right? They predetermine absolute elevation angles and relative azimuth angles. So all of these multi-view uh, approaches are basically hard-coded where these multi-views are always some specific hard-coded view and it's basically what they're telling you here is that they also have some heuristic that makes sure that these multiple views are like uniformly around it so it'd be kind of cool if you relaxed that constraint like if you got rid of this constraint of like this is the specific four views or like these four views have to specifically be uh at nine degrees from each other like what happens if you don't do that Right. Do you really need this extra constraint of the multi-view in order to get the results? What happens if you just picked four random camera views? What happens if you picked a hundred random camera views? Fix the conditioning camera's in extrinsics to have identity orientation following the practice of LRM. We output the uh, triplane nerf from the final denoising step as the generated 3D model. Okay, so here, Frechet, Inception Distance, Clip, Peak Signal-to-Noise Ratio, uh, LPIPS Distance, these are all uh, different ways of judging the quality of an image in a, or a quantitative way. I generally am against these. I feel like every single week you guys hear me rant about <laughs> things like the FID, but don't read into that. Those, this table is basically garbage, is what I'm telling you. You need to look at this and qualitatively, subjectively, come to the conclusion that one is better or one is not better, but these numbers can be misleading. Okay, I guess here we have a little, uh, let's look at this, ablation study, so without the plucker coordinates versus with the plucker coordinates. 
Wait, those are actually, it does kind of seem like it's making a little bit of a difference here. Maybe not. Some of these is a wash, right? Lower is better, so this is worse. Higher is better, so this is worse. Higher is better, so this is worse. Higher is better, so this is worse. Okay, so it does seem like the plucker coordinates do help, so maybe that's a... Uh, Maybe we should be doing that. Maybe we should all be using plucker coordinates. I'm going to have to read this Wikipedia page. This looks so gross. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, we've got 15 minutes left. This is going to take a while to summarize. How about, I, how about this? Let me drink a little bit more coffee. You guys ask some questions, and then we will... Summarize what we learned, and we'll end it there. How's it doing, robot? You doing good, little robot? There you go. There you are, little robot. Okay. Use quaternions. That's what I want. Yeah. Uh, BTW, am I hiding my Chrome bar? Yes, I, I did switch to hiding the Chrome bar. So I used to show the Chrome bar, but then I like realized that like you can look at like my pre-complete. I don't know. It started to get a little weird where I was like, maybe I shouldn't be giving this information out. So I kind of switched it so that now... Uh, You can't see the top, but yeah, I think you guys are right. Maybe I should be uh, more explicit when I switch the papers because you guys can't actually even see what the what the hell I'm looking at. You know, it's not like it looks much better to me anyways, though. It looks like this, so it's, it's very difficult for me to understand uh, which paper it is anyways. Switch papers when we go switching tabs. Okay, okay. Feedback taken. Uh, all right. I, the secret is I don't actually know which paper it is either. <laughs> okay. Uh, so today, we reviewed a couple different uh, text to 3D and image to 3D papers uh, that came out relatively recently. Uh, we looked at DMV3D, denoising multi-view diffusion using 3D large reconstruction models, coming out 15th of November from Adobe Research. We also reviewed the earlier work to this, which is large reconstruction models for single image to 3D, also from the same uh, Adobe Research group. This one came out just a couple weeks ago. Then we have uh, this one, 12345 plus plus, which is the extension to 12345, which is another earlier uh, text to 3D and image to 3D work. Here we have 14th November, 2023. So this one's recent too. And then the last one that we looked at, which was kind of a weird paper, but it had a couple interesting little things in it. This one is Instant 3D, Instant Text to 3D Generation from the 14th November 2023. So all of these papers are basically generating textured meshes. So these here, these are all textured meshes, which is a representation that has both a mesh Right, which is a set of vertices that are all connected in forming these little triangles and a texture, which is this. It's basically just an image that you wrap onto a mesh with a specific, uh, a specific kind of like wrapping uh, UV map. I don't know what to call this, UV unwrapping, whatever you want to call it. But the way they achieve it is slightly different. There's a bunch of different uh, strategies that they employ in these papers. So the two Adobe papers, what they're largely doing is they basically have this encoder decoder setup. The encoder is starting from an image, breaking it up into patches. It's using the uh, Dino Vision Transformer to turn it into a uh, little compressed set of image features. This little image features are then used, uh, fed into this decoder here, and specifically the cross attention, right? 
Uh, it's also being concat or fed in with a camera features, camera features which are in this uh, weird plucker coordinates, which does seem to be a slightly better way to describe camera positions and camera views than the original Nerf uh, XYZ Theta uh, Phi or the also popular uh, azimuth uh, elevation. And along with that camera information and then the encoded image information, you basically uh, get these triplane tokens. Those triplane tokens are then reshaped into three orthogonal planes. The three orthogonal planes come from this paper here, which is an older GAN paper. This older GAN paper introduced this novel, uh, this is a 2022 paper, so it's literally ancient at this point, but introduced this new type of uh, representation, which they call the triplane representation. You can kind of think of it like, kind of like a position encoding, but like built in, so it's a little bit nicer, and, and it's uh, basically an upgrade to the more implicit representation of nerfs that you basically have to keep querying for every single pixel, every single ray, and it kind of gets a lot, a lot of compute takes a lot of time. So by having uh, three separate feature planes, which means it's faster, a little bit more explicit, right? Because you're now kind of explicitly encoding uh, the information into these planes, but it's a little bit faster, right? So here uh, in this paper, right, you can see it's about three times faster than a uh, standard nerf and about uh, one third the memory of a standard nerf. So this uh, triplane representation, very popular. And all of these papers use nerfs and all of them use this triplane nerf because it's popular. Uh, but yeah, once you have this triplane nerf, you can basically then generate uh, a 3D version of this uh, little object here. But this is just, this is not a uh, a textured mesh, right? You're going to actually have to render it from a specific viewpoint in order to create, uh, you're going to actually have to create a rendered, I'm getting my words twisted here, but ignore what I said. You have your triplane nerf. You're using that to render a bunch of novel views. You can then use a uh, reconstruction loss to push gradients through this entire process because everything here is differentiable, including the triplane nerf, including the volumetric rendering, including uh, this decoder and this encoder. So you could basically push gradients all the way into the self-attention blocks, the MLP blocks, all the different blocks in here. Uh, this paper extends that kind of one, uh, one weird way further. And what they do is they kind of make it multi-view. So you see how they're no longer just using a single view. Now they have multiple views of that image. And then they're also putting this entire thing into a diffusion model. So everything here is not only being conditioned on the specific camera information and the encoded Im image information, it's also being now conditioned on the time step and then wrapping this entire thing inside this giant diffusion model that slowly uh, undiffuses and diffuses, right? So this is pretty pretty badass and the thing they mention here it's also their technique is kind of uh irrelevant to the internal loop so like you could replace this internal part here and not use a triplane nerf you could if you found some other thing that was also differentiable you could put that in there so maybe the magical 3d diffusion gaussian splat that we were hypothesizing about could be fit right in here and it would all work perfectly um so that was that. The those two papers. The uh, this paper used a completely different strategy, which was it's pretty cool. And in this strategy, what they're doing is they're basically uh, they have three different diffusion models. They have first they have a original pre-trained vanilla stable diffusion model, which they fine tune to output basically multiple views given an image. Now they have a fine-tuned diffusion model that will output multiple views, and then they use those multiple views, they feed those into a dyno vision encoder, and then they also feed the original image into a clip vision encoder. You can think of this as the semantic information, right? This clip, this blue as the semantic information, and this green as, I call it the object E information, but like object E features, kind of like edges, you know? This is an object, this is not an object. And then they go through this like two-part process here where they have a 3D diffusion model. The 3D comes from the fact that the unit inside that diffusion model is a 3D convolutional unit. 
So it's convolving in 3D space inside this uh, bounded volume of 3D space, this cube, this voxel. And the first part, the first one just creates this occupancy volume and then the second uh, diffusion model here, which is conditioned on the clip and the dyno, creates a sine distance function and a RGB value for each of these little voxels. And then you can then use the marching cubes to basically render that into the final textured 3D mesh, which is the goal of all of these papers, right, is to create these textured 3D meshes. Um, but that's pretty much it. It's kind of, actually, no, maybe we should mention this paper, yeah. <laughs> this was the last paper that we looked at, and this was kind of more for entertainment reasons, but it was cool because I don't know if these people are necessarily, like, Either they're not AI people or they're recently AI people because they use words like albedo, right? That's kind of like a not a word that someone in the ML AI space would necessarily know. And then they do some weird shit that people from the ML AI space would not necessarily do, such as taking the clipped, uh, taking the output of a clipped text encoder and using the first token of that as the kind of semantic token and then using a uh, cosine similarity kind of loss between the first uh, token of the clip image encoder. And then they also do this weird thing here with this token to plane where they literally take the tokens coming out of a text encoder and then just reshape them into a 2D plane and then assume that that 2D plane is one of the triplanes. So they also use a triplane representation but they're doing it from text tokens which is really weird. And their, their results aren't that great, but I thought it was kind of an interesting paper to add into the mix today because it kind of does a couple unique things. Um, yeah, so this paper, the quality is Garbo, but uh, these two papers here, which I think are kind of basically the state of the art, you have one in Adobe and then you have another one in these uh, kind of more academic groups. But this is the state of the art of text to 3D and image to 3D so far, as you can kind of get stuff. It kind of works with the backgrounds. You still have a little bit of this Yanis problem, but you know it's pretty good, and we're making progress. And I feel like give this another two years, another five years, and we'll be able to generate super high quality uh, 3D things from just speech or from just a picture. That's it, guys. Very helpful, fun. I, I appreciate the love, Coco. Uh, maybe Gaussian splats could be specifically rewarded to have as a large Gaussian as possible in order to make a 3D model, but I don't know enough about splat to mesh. Yeah, I haven't really seen any, like, splat. The, pr the problem is that the reason people want to create textured meshes is because they want to be able to use this in all the existing 3D tools. All the existing 3D tools, such as Blender, uh, Unity, Unreal Engine, Maya, like, it needs to be a textured mesh. So, I think the we won't get, like, pure splat things until the platforms themselves change. So, I feel like someone's going to eventually basically dethrone Unity and Unreal Engine, we're going to make a game engine that is based entirely on splats. And I know that sounds like a crazy idea right now, but I feel like it's it's the way to do it. We're going to basically create something which is, from the ground up, doesn't use textured meshes at all. Right? It only uses splats. And then, people are going to do text-to-splat. So we kind of need to refactor the entire kind of 3D world in order to move into the future, but right now, because it takes too much effort to refactor the 3D world, everyone's trying to figure out how to take these 2D diffusion models and 2D image encoders and triplane nerfs and get them to create textured meshes so that you can then import them into all your favorite 3D tools. I think we're almost out of time here, so I'm gonna end it there. Hope you guys found some of this useful. Uh, I do have an announcement. I will be on vacation next week, so probably not going to do streams. Maybe I do a secret stream. I don't know. I'll let you guys know, but if not, I might not see you guys until a while, so hopefully you guys can read some papers until then, and see you guys later. Little robot's going to wave goodbye to you guys, and I'm going to blow this, and thanks Christopher, Coco, Akon, Kira, Josh, uh, SHZ, 
What else we got here? Ed, Vinayak, Liu, Generalist Agent, everyone else. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Spirabell. See you guys later. Eat a lot of turkey and peace.